Cowboy Joe here with a recapitulation of section 6.11 on asymmetrical projectile motion. Your goal by the end of this video lecture will be to be able to analyze and solve these types of asymmetrical projectile motion problems. So let's start with trying to figure out what is the difference between an asymmetrical and a symmetrical problem. Well, here it is. Let's say we have a surface and we shoot an object up and it comes back down then that would be symmetrical if it is all on one level. That means the time that it took to get to this highest point is equal to the time it takes to get down. The initial velocity here is equal to the final velocity at the end of the motion. How high it went up is equal to how high it went down. This is symmetrical. Another situation, we have two different levels and we kick a football off of this cliff and it goes down a level. Now, if we split that motion right there in half, the time it takes to get to that high point is not equal to the time it falls. The initial velocity is not the same as the ending velocity and how high it went up from this level is not how high it went down. So this is what we call asymmetrical problems identified by two different levels in the problem. If an object rises farther than it falls, then it's an asymmetrical problem. In that case, the box up and down are not symmetrical. But to a point, this motion would be symmetrical. So if we cut it off right there and made it one level, then all that would be symmetrical. But you can see if this was like a cliff or something, um, you would be falling a lot further. All right, looking at our first problem, is it symmetrical or is it not? Let's just say we took some kind of shooting device. Doesn't matter what it is, it could be a uh, one of those foam dart shooters or whatever it is at home. You find something that shoots an object, we'll point it straight up in the air and measure how high the object goes. With this information, we can actually calculate the shooter's muzzle velocity, which could be used for asymmetrical projectile motion problems. So in this problem, if we have that information, this is a symmetrical problem. So um, how high it goes up is gonna be how high it comes back down. There's only one level, it's going up and down. There isn't even any X in this example. Um, so let's just get the muzzle velocity with the third equation. And using that muzzle velocity, now we have four meters per second it, and that's not going to change. So this, let's say this steely that is being shot at four meters per second is shot at an angle on the top of a counter. Let's say the shooting device is 18 centimeters. No, the marble is 18 centimeters above the slab desk. Let's say this is a, a counter that we're shooting it from and the steely is actually starting 18 centimeters higher. But still, we, we start this problem the same way as we would before. This is shot at an angle. we got to break that up into its two components, the X component using vector resolution and the Y component, and they go in the same spots in the um, little big, big box. And now we have to use our given information, and we're trying to answer the question, where's this target going to floor? So in order to answer that, we need to know how far it goes horizontally. So the ultimate question mark for this problem is gonna be this D over here, which represents the range. If we wanted to figure out how high it went, our tape measure would be vertical and we would use these DFs, but it asks for um, how far does it go across so we can hit a target. So that would be the range. So in order to get this, we need one more number. In order to get this number, remember it is the sum of these other two Ts. So we can try to focus on the vertical motion and calculate how long it's going to be in the air. So with this box right here, we, we have four numbers. So we can get how high it rises above where it started until it hit zero for a vertical velocity, until it got to the highest point. We can also calculate the T. And then that will give us, this DF will give us our next number into the down box and we can calculate the T after that. So now we have sort of a path, let's start getting our answers. So first of all, we can use 
the third equation to get how high it rises above where it started, and that's going to be about 39 centimeters. So now we can use the first equation to get our time. So the time that it takes to go up is about 0.284 seconds. So now we can get into this box because these two Ds are connected. Remember, this D plus vertical difference is going to equal this D. So our vertical difference is not only the height of the lab station, but how much higher the steely is above the lab counter. So if we add those two plus how high it rose together, we would get this 1.482 number. And that is how far it's going to fall vertically. Now we can calculate the time using the second equation. Notice the DO and the VOT terms drop out. All we have to do is plug that in divided by 4.9 square root, and we get the time of flight for the fall. Notice it is a little bigger. We are falling farther, we should be in the air longer. So when you put those two times together, we'll have the time for the fall and how long it's in the air which is going to be equal to this time over here. So 0.834 is the sum of those two times, and now multiply them together. We get that 2.40 range number that we're looking for. So we would measure 2.40. If this is at the extreme corner, shot at the corner of this lab station, so the steely is right above, we would just measure 2.40 from the base, and that's where we would put our target. All right, let's try another problem. A rock is thrown from a 50 meter high cliff with an initial velocity at a certain angle. The cliff is 50 meters there, and it wants to know the velocity vector for when it hits the ground. Now, the neat thing about the velocity vector, <clears throat> if we were to draw a picture of this, this motion, let's say the ground is right here, and this motion is going to go from this lab station It's going to go up, hit a peak, and then come back down. So if we were to look at the velocity vectors independently, we can actually put them into this Moxie puzzle and get the X component. Well, that X component is going to represent how far it goes in the X and how far it goes in the Y, just like that. That's what it's going to start at. This is going to be the velocity in the x, and this is the velocity in the y. So, <clears throat> let's break that up and see what those two numbers are, and then get that red pen back out. As this... <clears throat> projectile goes through its motion, this velocity vector is going to be the exact same. No matter where you stop and analyze the problem, that V in the X is going to be the same length. So even right there, same length the whole way across its motion. Now these lines definitely aren't the same length, but this is going to represent the velocity in the X the whole way through and it's going to be the same. So now let's change let's change it to a different color here. Let's go with uh, pointer options, ink color. Let's go blue now. Now all the Y components, see this is just the starting Y. Well, I'm trying to match out of the lineup. This is just the starting Y. That's going to change as this object is shot that is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where it's not even anything. At the highest point, we're going to be at zero. And as it falls, it's going to start getting bigger again. <clears throat> Each one of these is getting bigger as it falls. As it falls, this velocity in the Y increases. That's what we need to find, the ending velocity in the Y. We know the X is going to be this. We need to end with a moxie puzzle to answer this question. So in this little big big to represent the motion in this problem, we know that this 4.2 always goes in the X. X 
component goes in the X box. Y component goes in the Y box at the beginning, 5.6. So we also have our six given information with 0, 0, negative G and 0, 0, G. So now the question is, what is this VF? That's what we need to finish the problem. If we find that VF in the Y, we can put it into this Moxie puzzle and get our angle and our magnitude, which will answer the questions. Find the velocity vector for when it hits the ground. So that's the ultimate question mark. Uh, can we get it? Do we have four? No, we have to get that DF in the up. Add 50 to it. Remember that vertical difference between two levels is added to this DF to get to this DF. So we need this DF with the third equation. We can get it to be 1.6, add it to 50, we get 51.6. And now we can use the third equation to get that velocity, which is in the negative direction. Notice you just square root this, it's 31.8 in this box. We let down be positive, but in this box, down is not positive, down is negative. Remember, this is what the calculators are programmed to. We can't change well probably could but we don't want to change the signs of what the calculators are understanding so when you are tan the y over dx we get a negative 82 degrees which is the direction that we want positive negative we want a fourth quadrant angle and now we have to square this square this and we got a square root and get the magnitude so this right here is your answer 32.1 meters per second at an angle of negative 82 degrees so that's it. Sometimes uh, they get a little complicating. You've got to use all kinds of boxes in order to figure it out. But that one right there, just in summary, when you're asked to find the velocity vector for when it hits the ground, you're asked to find the magnitude and theta of the velocity vector for when it hits the ground. The x is going to be the same. Notice the x goes into this box in the x box, and it also will end up right there as the x component of your final answer. But the y component changes. The y starts at a certain number. It goes to zero. And then it falls a greater distance or a less distance, different. But that final velocity in the y would be the y component. Our tan to go back and then use the Pythagorean theorem to get the magnitude and the velocity of your answer. Or the magnitude and the direction of your answer. All right, so asymmetrical problems identified with two surfaces. The up and down charts are not symmetrical. Um, remember that the horizontal velocity in this motion does not change, but the vertical velocity does. So um, remember, all horizontal measurements go in the X box. The vertical measurements go in the Y box. So if you can draw a line to represent the motion on a picture, that might help you identify whether it's a horizontal measurement or a vertical measurement. If it is by chance at an angle, and they do this with the velocity vectors a lot, the velocity needs to be put into the MOXIE box to get the X component and the Y component, which goes into the X box and the Y box. When you're asked to find the range, remember, it's going to be in the X box. The max height's going to come out of the Y box. The time of flight, remember, it's what connects the horizontal and the vertical motion, um, can be found by the X box t or the sum of the two y box t's and if it asks you to find that vertical or that uh, velocity vector for when it hits the ground at ending velocity you're going to have to use start with a moxie sometimes and end with a moxie so there you have it asymmetrical problems cowboy joe out